Well, hello there. Hey, buddy. How are you? First time we've talked since you've come back from Europe, I think. I know, dude. How are you doing? I'm, I'm well. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I am. Uh, I'm well. I'm, I'm well. I had a uh, relaxing weekend. I actually, I actually uh, uh, did a little bit of uh, flying in the air. My, my girlfriend had bought me a gift for my birthday, which has been months ago, but we just didn't use it uh, to do iFly. Have you ever done iFly? No, I've always wanted to. How was that? Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely very cool. It was uh, a very unique experience. It made me want to jump out of an airplane. So I'm probably going to do that at some point. I, I'm sure my wife has wanted me to jump out of an airplane many times. Uh, normally, yes, in fact, she's almost pushed you out of some airplanes if my uh, memory <laughs> so, serves. So true. Um, true. Yeah. Other than that, how was your weekend? Anything else exciting? No, no. We just we just chilled. Uh, went on our first date night in forever, so that was nice. nice. And then, uh, yeah, outside of that, kind of kind of chill. What did you do? Oh, um, you well, you know, other than the iFly, I'd say that the the highlight of my weekend was watching the movie King Richard. Have you seen that? It's about. Uh, uh, Richard Williams, Serena and Venus Williams's, or I guess Venus oh. and Serena Venus is the older. No, Have you I've seen heard, that movie. No, I haven't. I heard about it because um, didn't she do? Isn't she doing like a big memoir or, or a show about her? I'm her not past? sure. I think she is. But anyway, I'm go ahead. Sure. Uh, Alessandro, have you seen that movie? Have you seen the the movie? King I Richard? have. It's a great movie. And uh, PJ, you are right. She is doing some documentary on kind of like her life story. But that was an incredible movie. It really was. That's that's so my the the point I was going to make is that neither uh, Aaron or I really had anything to no point of reference right I didn't know the story and uh it's it's an incredible movie it's incredible actually in the context of braving business I, I think if you know if you're in our audience uh there are a lot of reasons why I think you're going to get something out of this movie um so I I highly recommend it but PJ let's introduce our guest we have an amazing guest today uh very unusual for us I, I'm joking all our guests are amazing but this is another incredible <laughs> guest, so let's go to it so today, our fine audience out there, we have the unique pleasure of having Mr. Alessandro Tronco on, who's the author of the Wall Street Journal number one bestseller, The Buddha Who Drove a Bentley, Live Your Most Authentic Life, Find True Happiness, and Have It All, which is an amazing book, and we're so happy to be talking about that today. Born in Sicily, so don't mess with him, Alessandro immigrated to the U.S. not once, but twice. He liked it so nice. He did it twice. Once as a six-year-old with his family and then as a 15-year-old on his own with just $5 in his pocket. I'm sure the story there is mind-blowing, and we're definitely going to dive into that. Alessandro's journey is one of perseverance, resilience, ambition, and courage. Despite numerous challenges, Alessandro managed to climb the ranks of a Fortune 100 company, Northwestern Mutual to become the, one of the youngest managing partners in the 166-year-old company's history. Beyond his professional success, Alessandro is a dedicated philanthropist, a person of faith, and passionate advocate for justice. Today, we will hear his story, talk about his best-selling book, and hear his insights both on overcoming adversity and manifesting a better world. Alessandro, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Braving Business Podcast. Well, thank you, guys. It's a pleasure of being on this podcast with, with both of you. So thank you. Alessandro, you uh, you have had some some journey, right? So the journey from Sicily to the U.S. and back uh, is incredible. But I want to focus on your returning as a 15-year-old. You, you said you started with just $5 in your pocket, which uh, you don't – I'm assuming you're in your 50s. Maybe you're just uh, exceptionally young yeah. looking. Okay. okay. 50. So. 50. So I came to this country in 1986. I was 11 years old. I don't know how, uh, I assume you roughly came around the same time. $5 would not have gotten you very far. Um, for what year was it that you came here uh, as a 15 year old? So it would have been 89. 89. Gotcha. 89. So, so very similar time frame. So tell me what were some of the immediate challenges you faced? I can think of some, but, and how did you overcome them? How did you over, how did you manage to survive a day in the United States with, with that type of a, set up yeah so let me just back up for one second my, my mom like when we moved back we didn't really want to move back and my mom knew that there was no future in sicily and so my mom went and she sold her engagement ring and was able to buy uh two tickets one for me one for my older sister she was 16 and we both went our separate ways when we got here and i think that's important because mm -hmm. she knew enough that the american dream was still better than most other countries if not all and so the challenge you meeting, you have to remember, there was no cell phones. There was no credit cards. Um, so when, when you land here, I, I called a friend of mine before, a week before, and I stayed with a friend of mine. I immediately rolled into high school. Uh, amazingly enough, they let me in without really any paperwork. Um, or at that point, it was uh, middle school. 
And then I went and got a job. And so immediately I felt alone. I felt scared. I didn't know what I was doing here, but I didn't want to let my parents down to like call it quits and go back. I knew my, my, my mom particularly had sacrificed a lot. And so I could only move forward, but it was definitely a very scary time as a 15 year old with no family and no money and really very, very little communication. Wow. Well, can, real quick in that. So you and your sister split ways. Like, where did she go? Like, how come you guys didn't hang out together? Well, we could live in the same house. So I stayed with a friend. She stayed with a friend. We had no family here. And mm. so we really didn't have didn't have a choice. And we thought it was going to be like maybe a couple of months. It ended up being 18 months before my mom finally got her way back to America. Wow. Mm. Wow. So like growing up as you did, right? This is very... Uh, extenuating circumstances, I guess. Um, I imagine you ran into people who have had experiences that both built your character and probably taught you some lessons, uh, both positively and negatively. Would you mind sharing a story with us that you feel had a big impact on you and your outlook and then talk about how that experience ha helped you shape your approach to life as well as business? Yeah, so I when, when I came here, I started playing sports. Soccer was a sport there, but soccer was really popular in America, so I played football. And I met this amazing guy. His name is Andy Farragut. He was both my football coach. was also uh, my karate instructor. And I would say after about eight months of living alone, I was going down the wrong path. And down the wrong path enough where, unfortunately, I ended up in some, in some trouble with, with uh, law enforcement. And I, I did spend one night in county jail, which was the best thing that ever happened to me because I knew that wasn't going to be my path. And... But the next morning I got there, I had no, I meant no family, no money. Uh, I don't remember what bail was, but even if bail was a dollar, I wouldn't be able to afford it. My football coach came and got me and he didn't really know me that well. And he said, hey, you're going down the wrong path, but I know you're a good kid. I know you're smart. You're going to come and live with me. And if it wasn't for Andy at that time in my life, things would have been much different. And the learning lesson there was in business and in life, you never know what act of kindness can really change somebody's life forever. And Andy did that for me. So I've never forgotten it. You know, it's oh. incredible. As, as you tell that story, I, I can't help but think about the uh, somewhat eerie parallels, right? I came to the United States in 1986. Oh. I, I, I came with my parents, but I, uh, my parents did not have very much. And uh, likewise, they were able to enroll me in school, even though we were undocumented. And, uh, and I likewise came from a country where soccer is the sport, not not football or baseball. I played soccer and I was quite good at it, but nobody cared in the United States <laughs> at the time. And so I picked up baseball and I, I knew so little about the sport that being left handed, I bought a glove for my left hand, which is the exact opposite, because if you're <laughs> left handed in baseball, you need a glove on your right. And I had a baseball coach, uh, Phil Papier, who I'm still in contact with. Uh, hi, Phil. Hopefully you're listening. Great guy who took me under his wing. And uh, even though I was a terrible baseball player initially, uh, he saw something in me as a human being and as an athlete. And uh, he really, really took me under his wing. Ultimately, I ended up being a, a fairly decent baseball player. Uh, but more importantly than that, Phil taught me a lot about kindness. And I, I absolutely relate to what you just said. Uh, an incredible story. So, so, so let's go from there. You have someone that believes in you. And that's a huge part when you're someone that's young and impressionable and struggling to have another human being, even more so someone not from your family, not somebody blood related to you, take a, take an interest in you, uh, had to have been really profoundly impactful. How did you, how did you channel that into what happened next in, in your life? Well, the minute I knew somebody believed in me, there was one more person I didn't want to let down in my life. So from that point forward, I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take school seriously. I'm not going to hang out with these kids anymore because they're going to lead me down the wrong path. But there was just one more person that I needed to prove that, that he was right, that, that I was worth saving, that I was worth caring about. And so, you know, those moments when you want to quit, when things get hard, whether it's high school, whether it's college, whether it's, you know, washing dishes for 60 hours a week for minimum wage as a, as a 16 year old, it's just like it gave me enough drive and motivation to say, I don't want to let these people down and all the, the suffering that my parents did and the belief that this guy had in me, I wanted to him to be proud of me. I am still in contact with him today. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to be proud of me that what he did um, stood for something, that it wasn't just 
for nothing, that he really did make an impact. Sure. Sure. So like you, you, you were so, uh, you know, you're lucky to have this person who, who was like, kind of like a, who had such a positive impact on you. And then how did you, how did you transition from like, you know, your, your upbringing and, and scrappy, right. You're, you're working your way up to becoming like the youngest managing partner at Northwestern Mutual. I mean, that's a huge leap, right. But I'm sure that precociousness and, and stick to itiveness and never say die was a big part of that. Um, you know, but you're, you're able to achieve far more than others were at a, at a young age. Um, you know, and a lot of, a lot of people have that in common, right? We, we talk a lot about that. We talk about the, the inner tenacity, the temetry that people have in order to, to try to carve out their own future. Um, if you had it narrowed down to one or two reasons why you were able to be successful in this, what do you think one or two of those would have been? So what is definitely drive? Like I was, I didn't want to be poor anymore. I knew what that was like. Mm. And I didn't think money would solve all my problems, but I thought it would solve some of my problems. And that's the, the basis of, of my book that maybe we'll get to. So that was one. But, but the second thing is, again, when I got to, to, to my company, there were some people there that mentored me. They said, if you do what we tell you to do, you can rise as high as you want because here we need work ethic and doing the right thing. And so again, it came back to mentorship and somebody, because I didn't know anything about financial services. We had never invested any money. We never bought insurance. So I met the right people that said, if, if you're willing to work, if you want to be coachable, that you can do whatever you want here. And I believed them. You know, as a, I started at 22, as a young 23-year-old, I believed them. And I knew enough to know that I didn't know anything. And that's a big key in business. A lot of people go in there with egos and I knew I didn't know anything. And I was like, you tell me what to do and I'll do whatever I can to do. It. And that was that was a blessing because not knowing what you don't know is is critical. And a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. You know, I I uh, respect what you just said, particularly the part about not having an ego. Uh, it's surprising, even young people coming into jobs uh, sometimes get in their own way because they believe that the way to curry favor and or uh, earn recognition is to seem like they know more than they should. And obviously, if you're fortunate enough to be someone that, for whatever the reason, happened to know more than you normally would at a certain age, great, lean into that. But for most of us, we know what's appropriate to know at our age, which is not much. Uh, and something I learned and didn't happen immediately for me, to put it mildly, I think for many years of my career, I struggled with admitting this. Uh, it is the power of saying, I don't know. Uh, when someone asks you a question, saying you don't know or you're not sure is actually quite powerful. Um, and it's disarming. Uh, you know, when it's someone that potentially could teach you, it's disarming and inviting. If it's somebody that is like you, not in a position of knowing and is a little concerned, it's, it's, it's reassuring and it invites uh, transparency. Uh, tell me, how did you not knowing, how did you manifest not knowing into essentially what ended up becoming uh, a huge success story, right? Becoming one of the youngest managing partners in a huge global company. It, it doesn't just happen because you, you people tell you what to do. You, you also brought something there on top of that, some extra sauce. But but let's start with the I don't know. Let's start with the I don't know and, and walk me through when you started to know, how did you bring those two things together? Yeah, so starting to know just gave me more confidence and being, being able to go and, and talk to clients and talk to bigger clients that had more money. And so I just built more confidence. And then once that confidence came, I, I didn't stop. So I kept learning. I kept taking every exam I could take. I, I've read, I've lost track of many books I've read. Um, so I, I kept reading books and I just kept getting more and more and more knowledge. Um, but what still suited me very well, especially with older clients, again, at 25 or 26, how are you going to manage my money? You're, you're a kid. Um, and I would often say, even at that state when I knew a lot, I don't, I'd often say, I don't know that, pal, but I'm going to get the answer and I'm going to call you tomorrow morning with the answer. And people really, that resonated with people because they knew I wasn't just trying to sell something. They knew that I wasn't just trying to create an answer just for the sake of an answer. You know, so that gave me more, more credibility. 
Um, but when I started knowing, I, I knew so much more, but I still like today, I still feel like I have so much more to do. It's really interesting. I, I think uh, you, you just said something that I want to emphasize um, because I, I have no doubt that what I'm about to say is true. When you told them that you were going to get back, you, I don't know, but I'm going to do some research. I'm going to get back to you. What percentage of the time would you say you got back to them? Close to 95%. I mean, it would be rare for me not to get back to you. Great. Well, honestly, I expect you to say 100. Very, mm -hmm. uh, very honest and humble of you not to, because you know, it's true. You don't always, sometimes you just don't have an answer. I would normally get back to someone, even if I don't, but what you just touched on is another way that someone that is up and coming and doesn't have a lot of knowledge can earn respect and a tremendous amount of it, which is whatever you say you're going to do, freaking do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's incredible to me. I, I, you know, as you know, PJ, I work in consulting. I have a team of people working uh, with me and my biggest pet peeve is tell me what you're doing. Let me know what's going on. And if you make a commitment, keep me posted. Don't make me come back to you and say, so what happened with, okay. It's so powerful to say to someone, Hey PJ, I don't know the answer to this. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to get back to you in two days and they get back to them in a day to two, exactly as you promised earns an incredible amount of respect. So I'm, I'm sure that as part of the story. So you talked about reading. I, 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 I'm curious. How much of your knowledge would you say you acquired from a combination of reading and listening to people that were willing to share wisdom? Oh my God. I, I don't know a percent, but it was a lot. And you know, back then we used to have the little cassettes in the cars and there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a, a, a day where I didn't was wasn't listening to something in the car that was instrumental to my business life. Like I, I didn't listen to music, I didn't it was just you no know, podcasts weren't prevalent then. So all the time. I, I, it was, it was a majority of how I, how I learned and then real life experience, but books, I'm um, listening to people on, on cassette. It was, it was big. That's awesome. Zig so, Ziglar was my favorite. Oh, yeah. sure. I love Zig Ziglar. I went to some of his workshops, not, not so with him, I. but with people that work for him. Yeah. <laughs> so almost exactly a year ago, 2023, you published the Buddha who drove a Bentley and now is a number one bestseller. Congratulations on that. Um, also selected in January, 2024 as one of the five best books on quests by wall street journal. Why did you end up writing this book? And, and more specifically, why did you choose to write this book? Yeah. So I'm glad you guys have an authentic podcast. Um, my life was, well, my life was a mess. Like on the outside, it was, I had this perfect life. I had a beautiful family, beautiful daughters, car, like cars. And like on the outside, it was beautiful. On the inside, I was a mess because I just chased money. I chased success and, and a lot of other stuff I wasn't paying attention to. And so I, I woke up and, and I had this awakening that God, you're just like on the inside, you're broken. And, and, and I think a lot of people are. And so my life fell apart. And I was like, I have to do something different because I don't want to live the rest of my life like this. And that's why I wrote the book really for myself to really try to figure out what was happening, but to help other people. And the title was very calculated on why I came up with that title. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into that. It's interesting. I, I just had a conversation this week with a very successful uh, business executive uh, out of LA who uh, has a, you know, is in a particular field. And, and he said something to me that I, I don't, don't know him well, actually. And he said something to me that was very interesting we were discussing a topic that he knows very well. And he said, you know, there's so much of my life that's completely effed up that I, I know nothing about and I can't figure out, but this particular thing I can help you with. So it's interesting that, you know, not rare. Uh, I'm sure we're not breaking ground here by saying there are a lot of people that are successful professionally whose personal lives don't mirror that level of success. In fact, oftentimes there's some reasons that are related to their professional success that are directly uh, responsible or contribute mightily to why they struggle in their personal lives. What can you tell us about where you found yourself? I mean, beautiful life, beautiful family. Um, what do you think went wrong? What went wrong for you? I was just chasing money. I, w I was just chasing the title of success and money. And I let faith um, leave my system and I let values leave my system. And I never did anything unethical with clients. It was just my own personal behavior. And, um, I had an affair that 
totally devastated my family, but I'm happy to report that now that's been five years and we have, I'm still with my wife and, and, and God bless her and how amazing she is and my kids. But I was just like, I, I just couldn't get enough affirmation from money. And I was like, well, maybe this will work. And so that's what really, that's what really happened. And when that happened, I just took a step back. I lived, um, I lived in a cabin with no water, no electricity for six months um, in the Northeast. And, and, the, and the coldest temperature was, you know, minus five degrees. And I just, I just needed some, some solitude to be with myself, to figure out who are you, who do you want to be? And part of it was I thought I needed punishment for, you know, the actions that I had taken. And that was what that was probably the, the best six months of my life as far as like really figuring out who I was and who did I want to become. So you kind of like self exiled a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And I just, and I, and I spent so much time in thought and just meditation. And, and one of the issues with society today is we don't spend a lot of time in quiet time, like really reflecting. We're always, we're always on. And so I just needed time to, to just slow down and journal. And, and it was so critical. So now I, but that's, that's my new habit. I spend a lot of time in solitary. Yeah. Yeah. I tell us talking, talk, spoken many times about the importance of meditation and, um, you know, just trying to get yourself centered and mindful, right? That's, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, in your book, you also though spoke about the importance of forgiving yourself before you can forgive others. And, and, you know, you kind of alluded to it, but what, what brought you to this type of conclusion, which is a fantastic one and how, how has this, emboldened you? How has this principle played out in your personal and professional life? Yeah, so forgiveness is a word that a lot of people use, but most of us don't really know how to do it. And it does start with forgiving ourselves because we're, we're hard on ourselves. If you if you listen to the inner chatter, it, a lot of people are just negative, negative, negative. And, and at that point, I was saying to myself, you know, you're worthless. You're, so what? You had money, but but look at what you're doing. And and so I literally got on my knees and I said, the first person you have to love and forgive is you, because without that, nothing else matters. And I did that. And it took a while and it, and it took really a lot of prayer to like, do I deserve forgiveness? And we all deserve forgiveness, but that's hard for us. And it's easy to say, I forgive you, PJ, but do we really mean it? And um, that was that was that was hard for me, but it felt really good when I did it that I could look in the mirror and say, I love you. And I forgive you. That's awesome. I, I think it's, uh, it, it, it could, I could not agree more with the importance of self-forgiveness and with the statement you made that the chatter in most of our heads is often brutal. Uh, I've, I've spoken about that in, in other episodes. Um, we say things to ourselves. We would never say to the people we love, uh, or at least ideally we wouldn't. And if we did, we'd be deeply ashamed. And yet we say them to ourselves constantly. What an idiot I am. I cannot believe I did that. I'm such an idiot. How many of us have said that to ourselves? And oftentimes in many moments in our lives on a regular basis, how much have we beaten ourselves up for decisions we made? What a mistake. I cannot believe I did, could not see this coming as if any of us could see anything coming. Okay. Or we made a mistake parenting our child, which all of us have done. Oh my God, I cannot believe I said that to her. She, I, I'll never be able to forgive myself. I'm such, I'm a jerk. I'm not a good dad. That type of inner dialogue is, in my opinion, the most destructive, undermining way to live our lives. And it is, I agree with you, something that many of us, most of us deal with all the time. And it's the first step, like you said, and like you wrote, it's the first step in the journey of living a more meaningful, better life. Because ultimately, everything feeds off of how we feel about ourselves. It's You may not like that. You may like that. That's just the reality. The reality is however you feel about our, yourself is going to manifest in how you interact with other people. When you realize that, when you realize that the first step was forgiving yourself, because I would imagine that maybe it would have been easy given the circumstances, particularly the affair, that many people would have been in the position of thinking that the first step is your wife forgiving you. Why do you feel that the first step was you forgiving yourself? 
you can't move forward without forgiving and loving yourself. It doesn't matter who loves you it, 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 or f- who forgives you. If, if internally you're having this constant battle with yourself, you're going to lose. And it's going to manifest in a lot of different ways, whether it's an affair, whether it's drugs, whether it's addiction to alcohol, whatever it is, you can't move forward. I knew I couldn't move forward if I couldn't look myself in the mirror and say, I forgive you, I love you. And this is the person you are going to become. Um, I just knew I couldn't move forward. I had to be able to look at me in the mirror and really mean that I, that I love myself and I was a good person and that I was going to become the person that my kids and grandkids were going to be proud of. Uh, it would have never happened without, it wouldn't matter because my wife forgave me quickly, but she knew that I was hurting and she was, she, she just knew, but I, but I needed to do it for, for me first and foremost. You know, this is a, um, I'm, I'm not going to go off topic. I'm going to stay on topic here for a second, but uh, you know, people who have been listening to this podcast since the beginning might, if they've been paying attention, they might have noticed a little bit of a change in that early on in this pod, in the, in the series that we used to do, I tend to have a very deprecating or self-deprecating sense of humor, right? I, I could be really, really hard on myself and Tal would sit there and give me shit about it, right? <laughs> Like, I'd be like, you know, hey, uh, you know, I got more degrees in a circle or whatever. And and Tal would be like, shut up, right? Like, stop being hard on yourself. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is how I am. This is my, this is how I, how I, how I create humor. And then uh, one, one very low day, my wife was, who whom I adore and absolutely uphold and am a, her biggest fan, was hard on herself. And it absolutely i i felt almost like a physical pain right like i was just like what are you saying like what are you saying out loud about you about the person that i love and and it made me come back and self-reflect and be and think about that and think about what tal has been talking to me about and, and all this other stuff i'm like wow you know this is a um it's an important behavior to understand because if you're not kind to yourself and you're not, you're not evident of having self-love, then it really is, it really is hard to live a balanced life, I think. Right. And I think that's, you guys are, are both of you obviously um, have followed this very well in regards to your own personal lives. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard to see, you know, for, for me personally, it was, it was hard to see that, but I totally get all this now. So I, First of all, thank you, Tal, for being such an excellent friend. And, and you know, Alessandro, kudos to you for, for going through this and realizing, you know, I, I think a lot of people just like Tal said would be like, oh, well, you know, you went through that. Your wife should be the one who, who forgives you first. But truly, if you don't forgive yourself, it whatever comes in is all falling on deaf ears because at your core, you don't believe it. And so because you don't you probably don't think you're worthy. Mm-hmm. And if you don't forgive yourself, then it goes nowhere. So kudos to both of you, really. Thank you. And, and yeah, people might I, be thinking, what has that to do with braving business? Well, has that has, has everything to do with it? Like you can't, like you don't become a business person, you're still a person. And yeah. so when you connect these dots, like amazing things happen in your business. So if you're if you're out there listening and you're like, well, what does that do? It's everything to do with it. And you can be the most successful person in the world. Like if you don't get your own personal stuff, like that you love yourself and, and that you have value, like none of that mattered. But my business exploded, like once I got myself straight. It was, it was really, always really good, but my business exploded and I was happy and I, and I didn't feel like a fraud anymore. Mm. So it has everything to do with business. If you think, like, what is that? It has everything to do with it. The business part is easy, actually. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And I think that's... Uh remarkably true it, particularly in the sense that in the era we live in there it may not have been the case right we i i saw the chevy chase movie uh a few like last last year i saw the chevy chase movie where he had to go to his boss and ask for the christmas bonus and the boss was sitting in the end of a table that was like 50 50 feet long and the, the boss vacation. was an asshole and yeah, yeah. uh that's not the era we live in anymore we live in an era where people want to do business with authentic people with people that that resonate uh, values that they share 
And it is absolutely the case that people who uh, find a path to uh, self-health, uh, in my opinion, are far likelier to achieve commercial success in the world we live in today. And I think that's your book. You know, now I, I'm curious about the title. You said that there's a story behind the title. And I know, you know, um, but I, I'd love for you to share that story. So I think people believe you can either be super successful or you can believe in God and be a good person and you can't do both. And I think that's nonsense. I think uh, whatever whatever you believe in, um, I believe in God. And God wants us to be bountiful and plentiful, but he wants us to do it the right way. And so you don't have, like I, I do own a Bentley, you don't have to sell you a Bentley to be a really good person. And so, and I think people think, oh my God, I can't go down this path because I like my house and I like my, and, but it's not the case. You can, you can have both. Now, do you need two Bentleys? No. Do you need five Rolexes? Not going to make you happy. Uh, but you can have both. And when you have both, the, the greatest gift is you can now give back so much more to people that need your help. And so I wanted people to realize you, you can do both. You don't have to sell everything and go be a, a, a Buddhist monk. Yeah. You, if that's your path, great. But for most of us, you know, I like my house. Um, I like my car. I don't need five houses. I don't need 10 cars. So that's why that title was like, you can be both like, let's stop talking about one or the other. It, that's, that's awesome. I just want to put a side note. If you ever wanted to go more towards the Buddha route um, and you want to give away your Bentley, I, I know someone who, who might take it. All right. All right. Um, I'm trying to list. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the list is long. Um, <laughs> another key point in your book is to tell yourself the truth, no matter the cost. So that's, Love that, love that, uh, that little cur that precursor there. It seems kind of self-evident, but you know, we we think that we always tell ourselves the truth. Maybe not. Could you share what prompted this particular nugget of wisdom for you? And uh, where do you think that people may be missing an opportunity? I lie. I lie to my. I lie to myself all the time, and I and I, and I thought it wasn't doing any harm. Like, oh, it's it's not that bad if I'm doing this, or it's not that bad that I'm doing that. But your your soul knows when you're truthful with yourself first and foremost than everybody else. So every time you tell a little lie or a big lie, like your soul knows it and, and it and it breaks and it breaks and eventually like your soul is gone. And so the truth might be harder at first, but I promise you, anybody listening, it's the easier path long term for yourself, for others, for your happiness, for your well being. Uh, but I was lying to myself almost every day, like oh, not a big deal, not a big deal, but inside, like I, the soul knows when you're lying to yourself. And that's the worst person you could ever lie to. Mm. And you know, so that's, that's what med meditation is super helpful to what the, the, the process you're describing requires self-awareness, requires being able to even reflect on, on what is truth and how you're actually feeling, which is why I'm a big champion of uh, meditation, which is, a, which teaches you to have that inner calm that you need to have that conversation with yourself. So kudos on that. Um, let's talk about another component that's covered in your book that I think is really interesting, which is the importance of slowing down. You talked about how important it is to slow down to avoid missing magical moments. I'd love for you first to actually define what magical moments are because you might view them a little bit differently. I live near Orlando, Florida. There's, uh, you know, it's, I assume you mean nothing to have to do with Disney. But what, what does the phrase mean to you? And uh, what advice would you give listeners for how to practice in their daily lives? Magical moments are all around us. Look at a bird flying in the air. If you're not like mesmerized by that, you're not awake. And so a magical moment, like I have like, I'm now obsessed with birds. So I have like 10 bird houses everywhere. And the magical moments are when I see a bird come and just take their time and then go to the house, eat, leave, and another bird comes. That's a magical moment. They're all around us. And the big moments are, um, you know, I was just on vacation with my three daughters and my wife and just sitting there on the ocean, just watching them uh, play games on the beach. That's a magical moment. Uh, but, but every day that we wake up is a pretty magical moment. If you think about it, most of us can walk. Most of us have clean water. Most of us can talk. They're all around us. We're not paying attention because we're so busy doing life we're so busy on our cell phones and and computers and uh taking pictures of the moment instead of actually enjoying the moment 
And so the magical moments all around us, look at a sunset, look at the moon tonight when you go to bed. And if you tell me that's not magical, I don't really know what it is. Before this, I was dead to all those moments. I was like, oh, there's a bird, there's the moon. Like, just, just think about the magic of everything that's around us. And they're all pretty magical. Very, very cool. So, um, so you're also saying that even though you went away for six months, staying connected <laughs> and believing in your, or believing your life as part of a bigger story is, is kind of a profound idea. Um, what does that mean to you believing in your life and is, believing that your life is a part of a bigger story and how has that belief influenced your decisions and actions throughout your journey? I take every interaction as there's a meaning to this interaction. There's a meaning why we're talking today. And that meaning could be that there's one person listening that gets the book and has a radical change in their life. And so I take this podcast as whether one person listens or whether a million people listen. I know you guys want a million and maybe I do too, but there's a reason we're here. So now every person I meet, I'm like, what's the reason? What's the reason this person is, is in my life at, at this moment? And when you start doing that, it's kind of neat. It's like, okay, let's connect the dots of why, why we're actually here. I don't believe there's any accidents. And again, most of us are running so fast that we miss the moments of, you know, seeing the same person twice in the same week that you haven't seen in a decade. Like, what's the reason for that? And, and so it's fun to kind of analyze that and just pause and say, I might not know the answer today, but that answer will come in due time. But there is a reason. And that reason could be, you're having a really bad day. I say, PJ, uh, I appreciate, you know, we haven't talked in, in, in six months, but I appreciate you. It could be that little. That reason is why you're coming back into my life. So I don't, I don't believe in accidents, and it's kind of neat to know that there's a reason for everything. Yeah, I had a conversation just uh, over the weekend, actually. Erin, uh, uh, my girlfriend, celebrated her birthday uh, last week, and several of her girlfriends took her out. And, uh, and I actually, they went out by themselves. I went to the movies. Then I met up with them, and, and we had a really interesting conversation about, you know, about mediums and um, whether you believe in them or not. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to preach. Like I just don't, what's that? I'm sorry. You mean like psychics? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like psychics. Right. Uh, or really the ones that give you position. It's it, the, the ones specifically that allow people from the past to, to speak to people mm. from the present. Okay. Anyway, I'm not, I, the, my point is not about mediums. My point is about, uh, I think a shared view that I have with Alessandro, which is that there are no coincidences. I mean, sure, you, you could, it could. It, there are certain things that happen in your life, and they're they're happening for a reason. You may not understand those reasons, and the, you may actually be an instrument for someone else, right? So, so the reason may not be even impactful to you because it's not about you. It's actually about someone else's life. You just happen to be the person that is the messenger, but. But recognizing that that there is uh, kind of a tapestry and that we are connected in some way, a way that we don't understand, uh, is a heck of a lot more enjoyable. If nothing else, it's a lot better to live life thinking that way than to think it's all just a random mess. It's a random hot mess. So, it, I mean, you can choose to believe it. You can choose to not believe it. I happen to believe it. I happen to share Alessandro's point of view that we are all part of a bigger story. And I would say that by believing it, I'm manifesting things. And, uh, you know, kind of to tie that back to the Richard Williams, uh, you know, King, King Richard, Richard Williams, Venus and Serena's dad, that I started talking about at the beginning of the show. One of the really interesting things about him uh, was how much he believed in manifesting. He was telling his children, he had five daughters, he was telling them to write in their journals what they're manifesting for their lives as, as a way to achieve their goals and their dreams. And I see that as part of the equation. You don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but if you believe that there is a world around us that connect that, that where we're connected to each other in some way, uh, the journey becomes a lot more, a lot more tolerable. The the rough parts become, you know, part of the journey and not not overwhelming. Um, let's pivot and talk about philanthropy. So so you, um, in addition to doing well, you're doing good. And, uh, and good on you, by the way, for giving back and paying it forward. I have tons of respect for that. What causes, you know, you talked about a passion for justice. So that was part of our uh, introduction of you. Talk to us about that. Um, in what ways do you show your 
passion for justice and and how do you choose the causes you support yeah so um my wife got cancer a few years ago she's a, she's a best cancer survivor and so one of the things near and dear to us is uh cancer research so last year um we came in lymphoma society as this uh Eight, eight week contest to raise money. My wife raised almost a million dollars. She raised wow. more money than anybody else in the country. So uh, things that are dear to us, like cancer, homelessness, disabled children, um, and a lot of other things that when people come to us, I feel blessed that we can do it. And it, my philosophy is the more you give, the more you get. And that's been true to my life every time I do it. And so, um, so we do that. We, we give our time and volunteer and we're, we're, we're just trying to make a, a little bit of difference any way that we can. Um, but every time you give, I get so much more in return and in a lot of different ways. And, and so that, that, that's something we've done our whole life, but now it's even more profound with my wife getting cancer. And, and um, so the more you give, the more you get. And if you don't believe me on that, try for yourself and then see how it goes. But I think you'll be very, very pleased. That's awesome. And also thank you very much. Cause uh, my own very dear wife just went through that exact journey and uh, thank the, the good Lord above the universe and anyone else who threw good wishes our way that, you know, she's considered cancer free now. So thank God. Oh, congrats. Congratulations. A lot. It's, it's, it's a crappy road, but, uh, and it's terrifying. So many people get afflicted by it, but uh, kudos to your wife and kudos to both of you for, for taking up such a, a gallant and very worthy cause. Um, real quick though, finally, before we wrap up, wanted to find out what advice would you, Mr. Alessandro have for someone who's just starting out with very little, but they have big dreams, just like you. Write those dreams down. Pal talked about it before manifest, write those dreams down. Uh, but don't make the mistake that I made, uh, write those dreams down with the whole person you want to become, not just in the business world, but in the personal world. That's number one. Number two, you have to work. You have to work. The, the, the stuff doesn't happen easy. So in the beginning, when you're building, you have to work. Be coachable. Be humble. Um, and say thank you along the way. Say thank you to guys like you that are helping you, that you didn't get there on your own. You know, there's a famous saying by, uh, I think it was um, uh, Tom Tracy, or, but he basically said, if you see a turtle on a fence post, they didn't get there on their own. And that's always stuck with me. Like we all had help. And so they say, thank you. Be humble. Um, and, and, and But don't just write down who you want to become in the business world. That would be my biggest, that was, my, that was one of my biggest mistakes. That's awesome. It's, it's a great piece of advice. And I actually, uh, as soon as you said that, I looked up because directly above my monitor is my personal mission statement, uh, which I wrote and I continuously look at i placed it there for a reason it is the compass that i want to follow and it is about more than what i want to accomplish professionally in fact it is mostly at this point in my life but things i want to accomplish outside of professional success and uh i think that's a great piece of advice the part that is particularly beautiful is your statement don't just focus on what you want to accomplish professionally focus at least as much attention on who you want to be how you want to feel uh, how do you want people around you to feel when they are around you? Those are really, really important, frankly, substantially more important than professional success. They are going to be the reasons that you find and hopefully keep happiness. Um, so great, great advice, Alessandro. Thank you. Um, Thank our you. guest today was the Wall Street Journal number one best-selling author of The Buddha Who Drove a Bentley, Live Your Most Authentic Life, Find True Happiness and Have It All is available everywhere, including Amazon. Uh, it's a great book. It's not a long book. It's under 200 pages. It's something that you could take with you to the beach uh, or share with a loved one, maybe on a birthday. Great, great gift of a book. Um, and uh, Alessandro's journey is amazing. And, uh, and to have him sitting here, uh, having manifested so much uh, and shared as candidly as he did some, some difficult truths should be inspiring to anyone that's listened to this podcast. At the end of the day, many of us start from a place where we don't have much and that does not determine where we're going to wind up. And having a lot does not mean you're happy. So uh, the balance of Alessandro's, uh, I think, story is at, at the end of the road, 
Who do you want to be? What type of a life do you want to lead? Consider that a huge success if you have clarity on those things. And as you travel the journey that Alessandro traveling and you're traveling, be kind to yourself. I think that's the that's what I'm taking away from today, Alessandro. And I thank you for reinforcing lessons that I think are hugely, hugely important and can benefit literally anyone who's willing to put a little bit of work, a little bit of effort to manifest. It's a pleasure well, thank and we you thank both. you so much. Yeah. Thank you both. I appreciate you both for having me on. And and you guys are doing an amazing job. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and I'm a regular now. So you guys are doing really amazing work. And thank you for that. Thank you so much, Alessandra. It's awesome. We appreciate it.